So we, we left off last week um, disgusting, uh, <laughs> disgusting. It, it was disgusting out, wasn't it? We were outside, there were bees, it was, all right, well, <laughs> we left off last week discussing uh, the system of handling conflict in the church that Jesus gave his disciples and that the Apostle Paul reminded the church at Corinth. If you remember, the church had people suing one another. They had people going to court for issues that they did not resolve within the church. They were divided. They were angry. They were gossiping. They were jealous, and they were vindictive towards one another. They were acting the same, and dare I say, even worse than the world around them. So the Apostle Paul, he's looking from, from the outside in, and he, and he brings correction to them because they had lost focus. He did what a loving father does when he sees one of his children getting off course, right? He comes over, lovingly guides them and corrects them, sometimes gives them hard words that are uncomfortable. Listen, I, I, I need you to hear me out this morning. I know, I know that the modern American church has become a business. It's become consumerist. It, it's, it's driven to attract people into the seats and make you as comfortable as possible. Now, I want you to be comfortable here. I do. But the message, the gospel is this. You need to change. You could not change yourself and so Christ died in your place. And so now you will not answer for the sins you committed where you will not be held to now going to hell and separated from God, right? You, you have a righteousness. It's just not your own. It's, it's Christ's righteousness in your place, right? You, but... But that doesn't mean that the goal is now to lull you into a sense of comfort where all I tell you each week is how wonderful you are and how great you're doing and how everything is so good that you just you can't mess anything up and you've got it all together and we're really just here to celebrate how awesome we are. And that, my friends, is where the church has gone wrong. Is when it, when it lulls you to thinking that we should be honored that you're here because you're so awesome. No, no, no. My friends, we should be honored that we're allowed here because God is so awesome. There will be times where you are in such pain that it is my goal to comfort you but there are times where you are too comfortable and it is my goal to disturb you Amen. into action, into a willingness to look into a mirror and say, this is not right and I am not honoring God with my life. You see, without people in our lives to call us out on that, we won't stop and reflect or we won't look objectively, right? We, we're always able to come up with excuses and justifications for why and how we do what we do. And so it is out of love that a loving father bends his knee, looks his child eye to eye, not domineering, but gets his attention and says, son, you're wrong and you need to change. Love is what motivates that change. Love, the desire to see that child grow into a man or a woman of integrity who will continually carry out those changes in their lives because they'll remember their father or their mother bending a knee. And I, I, I read this article that talked about how 
the way your parents spoke to you as a child actually becomes the way you speak to yourself in your mind as an adult. If your parents were always yelling at you, you will always be yelling at you through your life. Stupid, I can't believe I did that. Why? Because maybe you grew up with mom or dad going, I can't believe you did that. Parents, take note of how we approach our children. But now adults, you are no longer children. You must look back and take the the time to reflect and go, man, why do I talk to myself that way? Why do I use these expectations or justifications? Why do I do what I do? And give that to God because God is not a father who screams at you. God is a father who meets you where you're at and makes the perfect adjustments that will push you outside of your comfort zone, but not to the point of crushing you. So put your seatbelts on, because it's going to get a little uncomfortable today. The mission of the church is to go and make disciples. It is the mission. Mission comes first. If you're off mission in the military, there's a term for that. What is it? You've gone AWOL, right? You've gone AWOL. You, 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 would, be, you would be discharged dishonorably for abandoning your mission. There's a serious issue there because there are high expectations and the church has become a place of low expectations. Where when we're off mission, as long as we're still, you know, not doing terrible sins, because we somehow have a system of which ones are okay and which ones aren't, that you're doing great. That's not the case. Listen, I spent years in youth ministry with, with dealing with teenagers and hearing parents say things like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of them. They don't do drugs. They're waiting till they're married to have sex. Oh, good. Yay. If if that was your standard, congratulations. I don't want to raise nice kids. I want to raise warriors. I don't want to raise kids that just don't do bad things. I want to raise kids that would give every bit of blood, sweat, and tears they have to further the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's who I want to raise. I I don't have time for sex and drugs and rock and roll and all that crap. I don't have time for that. I'm so focused. I'm so busy. I'm focused on getting the mission forward. I don't have time for that to slow me down. So avoiding those things just for the sake of avoiding them is not a good enough reason. And then we wonder why 90% of our kids, when they graduate from high school and they leave youth group, they don't want to come back to church. Because all we told them was drugs are bad, don't smoke pot, don't drink, don't have sex. Rules, 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 without any reason other than Jesus says it's bad. Well, Jesus sounds boring to a teenager. No, there's no greater adventure than Christianity. But we've done a poor job of illustrating that to our children. What is our mission? Our mission as the church is to go and to make disciples. It is to multiply Christ followers. Listen, not through conversion, but through relationship. It is the Holy Spirit who does the converting, not you. It is the task It is the calling of the church to disciple people through relationship. We show the world there's a better way, and that better way is through Jesus. But there's a problem when the church is supposed to be showing a better way and instead is showing a way that not only isn't better, but is significantly worse. The collateral damage of the church not being able to get its act together is the lost people around the church that we're supposed to be reaching. This is Paul's message to the church at Corinth. And this is my message this morning to the church. Not just at Park Center. The church. 
We continue this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Paul writes, As it is, to have legal disputes against one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves do wrong and cheat. And you do this to brothers and sisters. Paul is saying, wouldn't you rather be cheated or wronged by your brother or sister rather than causing damage to the mission? No, no, you wouldn't. Because your primary focus is you. What's more important to you, the mission or yourself? Now we could say it's the mission all day. But then we need to put our money where our mouth is. What is more important? My rights? Me not being willing to be cheated or or wrong because I have to fight for my rights and then throw a monkey wrench into the middle of the mission because it's all about me? Or is it more important that the gospel goes to the whole world? He didn't give us these instructions before discussing conflict. But Paul discussed how we handle conflict before giving us these instructions. Right? We talked about that last week. We talked about the proper way to handle conflict. But after you handle it, now you move on. You move forward. And sometimes that means you walk away being okay with being wronged and being cheated. Paul moves on to say, instead of taking it on the chin or turning the other cheek, they were wronging and cheating their brothers and sisters right back. Fights were breaking out. Sides were being chosen. And the church was divided all the more. Now let's let's address what what you are probably thinking right now. Does Paul think it's okay for us to be wronged and cheated by other Christians? instead of defending ourselves? Well, that sounds nuts. But the answer is yes. Yes. Paul expects us to be willing to be wronged and cheated by our brothers and sisters once we have walked through the process of the right way to handle conflict, and this is why. Because God is sovereign. Now, we could say that all we want, but if we don't live like we believe that, we are what the Bible would call liars. I told you, put your seatbelts on. Today's going to be rough, but it's my job to tell you the truth. Because at the end of the day, as much as I love you, and I do, I really do, as much as I love you, I answer to Jesus. And when I stand before him one day, if I held back truth because I didn't want to offend, I'm going to get a slap in the back of the head and possibly more. I answer to him and I don't want him to be disappointed. God is sovereign and God promises to reveal the hearts and motives of all people. If you believe that God is sovereign and you believe that all truth will be revealed, then you can be 100% confident that every wrong that has ever been done to you and every time you've been cheated will be vindicated and avenged by God personally. And that's not my words. Hebrews 10, 30 through 31 says this, For we know the one who has said, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You can move forward. You can be cheated. You can be wronged. You can be abused. You could be held down. You could be three nervous breakdowns in. You could be past the point where you think is of no return. I'm never coming back from this. But, but you know what? You can move forward. And you can rest in the fact that the sovereign God is the vindicator. 
So stop taking it into your own hands by fighting back or defending yourself. The greater focus must be the mission. The mission to make disciples, to show lost people a better way. How much of a better model can you be to them to, than, to, than to show them the peace and the power of willing to be cheated and wronged? Look at Jesus. Uh, never, ever confuse meekness for weakness. Don't do it. The Pharisees did. Rome did. Even the disciples did. They thought Jesus was powerless at the crucifixion. They ran. All except John, right? John's the only one that stayed. The rest of them ran, scattered, afraid. They confused meekness for weakness. Jesus easily could have gotten off that cross. And when I say easily, I'm talking all he had to do was think the thought and legions of angels would have wiped the face of the earth clean. You, you want to talk about power? They thought they had power when he was on the cross? No, no, no. It was not nails that held our Savior to that cross. It was his own will. It was his own desire because he saw your face and my face. He did that voluntarily. Never confuse meekness and weakness. It takes real strength to walk away and to be okay with being wronged and being cheated. What others may see as weak for a time will eventually be seen as strength. The strength in being able to surrender your rights in such a situation. Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. He writes, Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males. No thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now listen, this is not an exhaustive list of all of the traits of people who are far from God. But, some scholars believe that these are the primary ones in Corinth that needed to be addressed. That these were the issues going on inside of the church and more specifically, outside of the church. This was the culture at Corinth. In Corinth, this was normal. I don't know about you, but, but to me, Corinth sounds like the United States, does it not? I think this is so applicable to us. The culture of Corinth is very much our culture. Corinth was very, very wealthy compared to the surrounding regions. We are very, very wealthy compared to our surrounding nations. We lead the way Corinth led. Our culture looks like Corinth very much, and the church at Corinth very much reflects the church in the United States today. These are some of the traits of unrighteous people. These particular issues don't make somebody worse than anybody or better. They are just the reasons why a righteous and holy God cannot have a relationship with them apart from Jesus' righteousness taking their place. So Paul is questioning why they would act like lost people who they were there to love and disciple. You're supposed to be showing them there's a better way. And you're acting worse doing the same things they're doing. Except you hide behind grace. You hide behind the holier than thou. You're a hypocrite. At least in the world, they weren't hypocrites because they didn't say that they have a standard outside of their own pleasure. They're not hypocrites. They're following through on their own desire. We're the hypocrites. 
We say one thing and do the opposite. Paul is telling them to question their own hearts and consider whether or not they are, in fact, Christians themselves. He's reminding them of the things that kept them far from God before they were changed by Jesus. What happened? Why would they allow this to happen? They were there to change the world, not to be changed by it. We must keep coming back to the proper perspective. We. Me. We must keep coming back to the proper perspective. We must ask ourselves daily, dare I say even hourly, why am I here? Why am I here? Then we must remind ourselves and each other that we are here to make disciples. We are here to make Jesus known to the lost and dying world. And it is necessary to use words. Not only words, but we must live it out as well. We must raise the bar. We must be willing to be inconvenienced. We must be willing to be wronged and cheated. We must be willing to have our hearts broken. We must be willing to take risks. We, wa- we must be willing to open our mouths. We must be willing to care and to love and to go and to do. Because if not us, then nobody. The church is the hope of the world. It is. It's the hope of the world. That the church is the hope of the world? (laughs) The church is the hope of the world. We should make a plaque, right? Getting involved in the sins and the distractions that Paul describes above not only pull you far from God relationally, but it also places chains on you that hinder you from living out your call and your mission. Jesus set you free. He called you to live out a great life, to lead others to Him. That is impossible if you're in chains. Especially ones that you voluntarily place on your own wrists. So set free those who have harmed you. Because if you don't, you're only hurting yourself and getting off of the mission. Christ has placed you on a mission. If all you do is lick your wounds, you can never be who God has called you to be. You have to have the strength to be who God has called you to be, no matter what it costs you. And in due time, He will vindicate and avenge you His way. Now this morning is going to be Very brief. I just want to close with this. I know you're all like, what? Really? This is a miracle. Everybody just relaxed a little bit. The coffee might not even be done when I'm done preaching today. This is going to be amazing. You're welcome. (laughs) I figured if I'm going to hit you hard, I'm going to keep it short. How about that? Right? Spankings. They hurt, but they're quick. Right. <laughs> Just one more note that I feel would be wrong for me not to mention here this morning. This passage of Scripture is one of the passages that Christians go to when they attack the homosexual community and remind them that they're going to hell because of their lifestyle. Here's the irony about that. Paul is lumping together homosexuality with all the other sins listed here, including ones he just accused the Christians in Corinth of. He calls them greedy, cheaters, swindlers, and how they treat each other. He speaks of sexual immorality taking place inside of the church among Christians. He is addressing the Christians when he tells them of their former and current sins in this list. How dare anybody 
make homosexuality any different. Few things enrage me more than when Christians come up with their hierarchy of sins and go and attack people, especially, especially an identity that goes down to somebody's core. Are you kidding me? That, would, that, that, is, that is unfair. It is ungodly. And it's hypocrisy. For Christians to have disdain towards our friends in the homosexual community is such hypocrisy. And I hope for all of our sakes that the church never looks at gluttons and gossips the way it does at homosexuals. Because then the church will be empty. There will be nobody left in it. This is unacceptable. And we, we, not just us here, the church, and I'll tell you what, this is the one message that I hope every freaking Christian in America actually goes online and watches. Because it's unacceptable. And I've had enough of it. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing that when I tell somebody I'm a, I'm a Christian or I'm a pastor, that I can't just say that. That I have to add a caveat. Oh, but don't worry. I don't handle snakes and I don't pick at funerals. I don't go when that terrible thing happened two years ago in Orlando and have signs saying terrible things while people are losing loved ones at a funeral. There is nothing more vile than people that are supposed to be God's people. Oh, we've experienced your grace, Lord. We're disgusting, and we know we don't deserve you, but you got on the cross because you love us because you're so awesome, but we won't take those people. They're worse than us. Are you kidding me? No. No, you're far worse than them if you could think that they're worse than you. If someone is a homosexual and a Christian, you're welcome here. Let me be very clear. I believe that the Bible makes very clear that homosexuality is sin. But homosexuals are people. Gluttony is a sin. And as you can see, if you're watching, gluttons are welcome here. I struggle. It's real. Why don't we struggle together? Why don't we push through together? How about instead of dividing and judging one another by our weaknesses, what if we embraced one another and said, we're going to get through these hard times together. We're going to get through pain together. Listen, I didn't want to be fat. You think I like this? Do you know what this does to my confidence? Do you know what it does? Like, I avoid pictures and mirrors. Like, it's embarrassing. But you, 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 you think I signed up for this? No, I have issues. I have pain. And instead of running to Jesus every time, I've run to a box of Oreos. And that's wrong. I need grace. I need help. You've got your thing too. Guys, can we, can we get in the same boat? Can we row together? Can we embrace the fact that we are broken people in desperate need of Jesus? He's the only one that's got it together. We need to embrace anyone and everyone that will just give us a second of attention so we could tell them that we do care about them for who they really are. I almost want to rename this church the church without masks. No masks allowed here. Be real. Let the epic failure crazy mess that you and I are show. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You're not going to be judged. You're going to be loved. One of the biggest lies we believe is if I'm vulnerable, somebody will use that to crush me. No, be vulnerable. We won't let you get crushed. We all have our struggles. 
We address each individual uniquely. But remember, it is not our place to judge anyone but our brothers and sisters. And the way that we judge our brothers and sisters is with love and with a commitment to be there for them, to walk them through anything that you have the boldness to call them on. We're family. We're the church. And it's time for change. It's time for change. I'm done apologizing for the mistakes of the church. I love the church. But it's time for reform. It's time for reform. Christian consumerism must die. It must die before it implodes. It will implode. And I'm not, I'm not attacking mega churches. Listen, there's mega churches that are doing it right. There's mega churches that are doing it wrong. There's tiny churches that are doing it right. And there's tiny churches that are doing it wrong. This isn't a show. May it never become a show. We are not here for consumerist Christianity. We're here to change the world. It's why we're here. It's literally our purpose. It is time for us to be known by our love for one another. And this isn't just for Park Center, but we are one church. Not just the church of America, not, not just the church of the entire world, but the church of everywhere, all times. For the last 2,000 years, we are one church, and we need to start acting like it. Because the world around us is in desperate, desperate need of us to get our act together. So what does that look like? It starts with us, doesn't it? It starts with an honest heart-to-heart -heart moment with yourself. It starts by looking in a proverbial mirror. And while you're looking into that mirror, invite Jesus into the conversation. Give him full reign. Hey, hey, if he's your savior, he must also be Lord. Amen. Now, that, that's a word that you only hear in church now, right? But like 1,500 years ago, it was a common word for the master, for the person who got to tell you what to do, how to do it, when you got to do it, and when to stop. Right? Is he Lord? Invite him into the conversation. Be honest. And ask him, in what ways have I gotten off mission? Bless you. In what ways have, have I gotten off mission? And instead of beating yourself up and yelling at yourself and going, I can't believe I failed again, hit pause. That's not God. God is not flipping out on you like that. That's you. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. It's his, he has a gentle approach. So ask him to reveal to you what needs to change. Ask him. And then, shh. We live in a microwave, instant, Amazon Prime world. I got news for you. Simon Sinek has it right. You can do everything at the speed of light except relationship. Relationship takes time. And that is why what you have with Jesus is not religion, because then you could just show up on Sunday, do your thing, leave, all right, check off my, my Jesus box. No, no. Good luck maintaining a friendship or a marriage like that. All right, we did our once a week, one hour routine, check. 
I guess I'll see you next week. Really? I'd break up with you. That's ridiculous. It's relationship. It takes time. It's an art, not a science. It's a dance. So shh. And listen. Stop being so overstimulated. Listen. If you need to spend an hour in the shower, listen. If you need to get up a little earlier and go drive to a park, listen. If you need to stay up later and go find a beach somewhere, listen. The God who spoke everything into existence, who has way more on his agenda than you, waits for you to engage him in conversation. Listen. And then you will begin to fall in love with what he loves, and what he loves is lost and broken people. Discipleship should not be something that I need to train you in. Discipleship is the overflow of your love for Jesus Christ. The only strategy you need is to love people the way Jesus loves people. Let's start there. And if we start there, we're going to need a building real quick. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. But we don't love you enough. Help us to love you more. That we would get outside of the box, that we would stop our routines, that we would rethink everything in our calendars, that we would rethink how and why we do everything that we do. Lord, I know our jobs are important, but aren't our jobs just (laughs) a place where people are forced to be around us? What a great opportunity for us to love people and share the gospel. God, give us the heart to take advantage of that. Give us the desire. God, let us love as you love. Father, get in our faces. Challenge us when we feel that feeling coming up when we see somebody that we've judged. God, may we not segregate any group of people, but God, may we love how you love. God, even as I hear police sirens going by, it it, it makes me think, man, I don't know what that cop was doing, but the second that there was an emergency, they stopped what they were doing and went to go make a difference. Lord, let the Holy Spirit set those sirens off in our hearts. God, that we might recognize these are not projects. These are people. God, these aren't notches in our belt, but these are souls that you gave your life for. God, how dare we judge anybody? How dare we see as any, anybody is different or not worthy Father, we're not worthy. We're sorry. So make us uncomfortable. Shake us up and change our hearts. Lord, we love you. Lord, thank you that although we are broken, you still use broken things that you haven't given up on us. How dare we give up on anybody else, God? God, when we feel like we're not capable of doing it, that you would remind us that you still use broken things for your plan. We love you and we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name.